I'm the CEO of Scoot API. Uh, we are doing the software for uh, e-scooter sharing business. So for example, you would like to open a small sharing business in the city. So you buy the scooters, you come to us, we give you the personal brand, the white label, and you launch your business in your uh, home city. So we target uh, the small local cities uh, with the niche where you can uh, grow and successfully earn money uh, with your electric scooter share. Yeah, this is our web page, uh, which we're right now in uh, redesign, but it still looks good. Yeah, that's all. Thanks. Yeah, great. Hi, my name is Tanya Alochinska. Like, this is a hard surname to pronounce, but you might probably remember me. Uh, I'm from Pandadoc. I work there as a director of products, uh, responsible for a growth team. Uh, I've been with Pandadoc for about four and a half years, and we've scaled since then uh, pretty fast. Now, Pandadoc is a unicorn company, and we. Um, Basically, what we do is a B2B software for document automation. Um, yeah, and like I, I've seen the company grow from several thousands to more than 30,000 customers. So like, I'm happy to share my experience with what I've seen at Canada. Nikita? OK, so my name is Nikita. Uh, thanks for having me today. Uh, I'm a CEO and co-founder of Lazarwell. Uh, Lazarwell is a uh, uh, mobile app to help uh, our users, mostly health-oriented users, to predict and mitigate negative health effects caused by weather conditions. So uh, it's uh, like a mobile product uh, where, uh, where we have uh, under the hood uh, AI engine uh, to predict when you will have a headache or joint pain or you know, mood swing uh, caused by weather so the next time and uh, some kind of recommendations how we can mitigate this effect. Our uh, company was uh, founded by uh, me and uh, Palta uh, one year ago. Palta is a pretty um, large uh, mobile uh, health tech system with uh, 150 million of uh, active users. That's it. Okay, thank you for your input, Vinovas. We don't need to make an intro. So, the first question for you. Okay, you can start. Uh, so, how much did time did it take you to raise your first investments, uh, if you have raised them, and uh, when have you, when did you raise the, your first investment? If you okay, did. yeah, so my first investment was uh, at the 3 up stage. It took me about uh, two, two and a half months uh, of uh, going to everyone who listened with the prototype and the application. Yeah, after uh, two and a half months, uh, some of my friends, he believed in me and uh, he invested in me. And later on, as he um, told me uh, in a private uh, conversation that, oh, I saw that you have everything, but uh, you didn't. But uh, I still uh, glad that I invest in you. So, yeah, so it was two and a half months. Uh, yeah, it was a little bit like that. So I presented more... Uh, ready to yeah. go than it was actually. And, and how ma many interviews did we have? Um, maybe 50. The conversion is like one from 50. Yes, uh, but then actually the uh, the other people converted uh, from this 50 like after the first investment uh, company. Okay. And uh, yeah, maybe Tanya, if you yeah, I can I can skip Pandadoc. because I didn't fundraise for Pandadoc. Yeah. Yeah, if you know Nikita Mikado, you can probably ask him personally. He will tell you more. And he's also very open about sharing the stories. And he's investing by himself uh, into startups. So feel free to reach out to Nikita anytime. Um, yeah. So from what I know, and this was like quite a long time ago. Um, I know that they um, collected around from several investors who are mostly angel. Um, some of Belarusian people, um, and some others, but I would not say a lot of details because I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, so I have like uh, two experiences uh, at my current company and uh, uh, previous startup. So um, my current company we raised just once because it's pretty 
to a large uh, pre seed round, uh, so one year ago, and it took around, you know, like from the two two months, we have like a, uh, I don't know, four or five um, <coughs> negotiations on the early stage, and uh, eventually we uh, moved on with uh, butter. And uh, at my previous company, my previous startup, we raised uh, two times a pre seed round and a bridge round, and uh, both times it took around, I don't know, three or four months. And how many uh, pitches have you made before you get to these four or five uh, negotiations? Or you just had uh, working and uh, uh, it helped probably, you? Yeah, it, yeah? It, it, it was uh, four or five uh, pitches. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so negotiations just started. Nice results. Yes. And Michael, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, like, Typically, uh, something that, that we like to see is so-called North Star metrics, so the one core KPI that you know founders and the whole company checks every morning, and you measure the development. What is it in like your cases, and how did you find it? Did it evolve over time? Uh, in my case, it was uh, the MRR that we get from the scooters and the number of the scooters that we have on our platform. Mm -hmm. In our case, it's uh, just very plainly the number of paying customers and revenue is the North Star. If you talk about product North Star, it's uh, the number of documents that are sent. Mm -hmm. It's a current moment, uh, it's a current company, we still don't have uh, monetization because we are now focused only on the product side and uh, that's why I can, you know, uh, share something about the revenue and MRR and, and etc. But uh, yeah, so on the current stage, our um, no stock metric is a um, um, DAO, so daily active users. And uh, as an active user, we count not just a user who opens the app, but who retain by uh, uh, core actions. And uh, it's our uh, no stock metric. And uh, as a second order, I also, um, like a few times a week, I consider our lock rate it's a number of symptoms logged by our users uh, during the day or during the week, so it depends on the time frame in the task. Mm -hmm. And Tanya, you're probably the most advanced with uh, the product. Uh, how do you like measure or decide which product improvements make sense and where you want to focus the team efforts and resources on? It's a complicated question because like we're quite a big company already, so. I'm not sure like it will be super interesting for people, but like for small startups, usually there is the prioritization based on what could bring us the best benefit in terms of either usage or additional monetization. And so this um, is the work that is usually done by the founder and product managers where the list of these things is being prioritized and selected on what to work next. In addition to that, uh, there are things like the company strategy, the company vision, if we know that we're lacking some specific things in product that our customers have or that find open new markets for us, we might go there as well. So I mean like this is not something I can answer in one sentence. So maybe like if people have some specific questions like uh, I'll be glad to share. But like complicated. In addition we have as of right now we have around thirty product managers responsible for different parts of the product. So it's also kind of you know, but like a lot of people are involved. Like. And what is the metric in your growth team? Uh, so in growth yeah. team we overview the full product funnel and so we track um, all of the revenue business metrics related to the stages uh, of the customer. So the first the customer gets into the platform, so we track the number of signups, then it converts into an activated customer who sent at least one document, then converts into a paid customer. Um, so we track the conversion rates, the ARPA and the number of uh, the new customers coming in. And then these people expand, so we'll also track expansion, and at the end we we'll track churn and reactivation metrics as well. So, like um, honestly, like I have um, like a ton of huge dashboards that uh, analytics uh, uh, check. Do you, use, uh, do you have your own? Um, we use Amplitude for product uh, metrics, and we use Tableau for uh, everything else, and specifically for our financial metrics and everything that's connected with money. But these are again like these are things for big startups. Amplitude is good because you can use the free version for a startup normally, 
Um, and Tableau, well, it's complicated um, if you have like a person to run it, like an analyst. It's simple. Yeah, so financial <laughs> metrics are usually done just in a spreadsheet or like later on you can use like if you have a subs subscription system, you can have um, a system on top that shows you the basic metrics for the startup, like their metrics or something like that. What about you guys? What? Do you use Amplitude? Oh, I probably uh, use Amplitude. You probably use Amplitude. Yeah, Amplitude. recently yeah. add Amplitude, but we still, um, like guys show me the data from Amplitude. I still don't get the valuable uh, insights from it, so mm -hmm. we need to purify it. So it's early to say, but um, we're experimenting. Maybe you can new startup team. Huh? New startup team. Team, you and Tanya. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, advisor. Yeah. Um, strategic <laughs> advisor. Oh, oh my, like that. And you, what do you use? Are you going to use? Uh, like a bunch of uh, bunch of tools. So now uh, we have an amplitude revenue cut. Uh, I don't know for, for what, because we still don't have amortization. <laughs> And uh, an F supplier for uh, introduction. Also, we have our own um, analytics or BI system uh, built over the rough data we collect. We also use the Google Analytics, that where we get uh, a data that shows us something. And then to it is like we are trying to improve it and trying to go deeper and go for the audience. Actually, related to analytics, and doing analytics, so maybe short story when analytics was completely useful or it delivered concrete value added, and you maybe was surprised that yeah, it's like simple data product or advanced, but actually it's improved uh, some something for your end users. You offer a service? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe, but actually, we're, just, we're also building startup. So I'm interested which in which direction, uh, like it's more profitable to invest uh, resources. So from your experience, maybe some simple metric you created and you realize that oh, I should change direction of, of part of the product or company, something like this. Or invest with a lot of stage of the company. Sorry. On which stage of the company? Any stage, something that was surprising and shocking for, for you when you see the data, when you see actual numbers. Because I realized that sometimes we don't have some some metrics, we create them, and it could change how we perceive, perceive the business. What is the case for you or not? Mm, sorry, I don't understand the rational behind the question, so probably. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, you will no. cover it. Right? <laughs> we do some customer development. But, um, well, I don't know, like, but like, most of our needs are covered by either Amplitude or Tableau, and usually some insights come when we look at the data segmented in, in some way, and so the segmentation differs based on the task that you're trying to achieve. For example, if you look at the revenue, you can look at the segments, and the segments could be company size, or the segments could be the pricing plans, or the segments could be something else. And basically, when you find, uh, like, look at different segments, you can see some insights in the data. That, for example, um, most of your customers are small companies. So basically, um, now you know, and now you're able, I don't know, to improve your marketing or stock spending on enterprise sales. So um, yeah, basically things like that. So usually, some kind of segmentation helps. Mm, A/B testing tools are good because, like they can kind of give you uh, the results, like if they're easy to install into the product. Uh, but we use like a combination of tools here, and it's like not super convenient. But, but like it gives you the insights of what changed, like so yeah, obviously. And I, I want to add something else. Um, so as I understand your questions, so you ask what uh, is the right time to implement the metrics uh, to start track them. So in my opinion, it's when you have the question, like uh, what's going on in particular part of the product, when you begin to ask this question like over and over and you seek the answer. So in my opinion, this is the right time to implement the metrics and find out. Can I? Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, yesterday, um, there's three days of Facebook training uh, 
for me was finished yet. Yeah? It was about game changing uh, in Facebook field. So uh, what, what I wanted to ask about analytics, uh, do you use uh, Facebook or Instagram platforms for achieving clients? Uh, and in this case, uh, if you use, I have some questions. If you don't, I, I don't have. <laughs> Uh, we don't. We use, you're talking about the uh, ads creatives? I'm, I'm talking about ads creatives, uh, audience, Facebook pixels, uh, conversion APA, uh, okay. something like this. Yes. Uh, yes? yes. So, sure. uh, one surprising thing for me was uh, that uh, there was a complete game change, game, game change in, uh, in, uh, in the last year uh, when uh, conversion APA, uh, right now, uh, all you need to have conversions from Facebook. You you don't sh you don't have to uh, show them what elements you want to achieve. You you should show uh, what business metrics you want to achieve on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm I'm wondering about metrics. Uh, do do you have an experience in uh, using uh, new algorithms of Facebook as yes, now? Just from a uh, high level side. So like a. In details, my marketing team is responsible for yes, me. Yes. Yeah, but in like in, from the high level perspective, I understand so what you're talking about. So, so uh, I, I'm just I'm just wondering, uh, do you have an ex an experience of using this kind of achieving audience uh, this tool? This tool of achieving your audience, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook audience. Yes. Yes? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. So, yes. so uh, I'm sorry, I think okay. we're jumping here. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. I would encourage you gentlemen to take it offline. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. I, I will ask. Uh, probably it's a very much case. If we could relate to, to Piotr's presentation, and like for you gentlemen, the question would be like the, the initial customers, were you actually using the paid acquisition channel or leveraging Finesia and creativity? Uh, and for you, Tanya, are for a company at the stage of Pandadoc, is it uh, still the, the time where you're using growth hacks, uh, or are you rather uh, working on channels just where you just scale? Uh, who the first? You can go. Okay. <laughs> uh, so for me, question was uh, which channel we we use? Like to did, did, you, first did, you, did you acquire the initial customers via paid channels? Or yeah, yeah. With all yeah, mostly all mostly through the paid channels because. Um, like we, for the next year we have like a big plans for our organic marketing and uh, different kinds. Like we have a b bunch of, uh, I would say, uh, channels to uh, engage our customers and reach reach new audiences. But for the uh, first ones, like uh, early adopters, we mostly use the pay channels because only because of speed. And how big was the budget for, for the initial? Uh, not so big for our our area of projects. I would say it's. Around I don't know fifty thousand USD. Per year. Uh, it it was just a, you know like a time frame probably per two months I don't know. Like, so just to get like the initial. Yeah 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 ju just to test the first hypothesis on the market. And have you managed to find those who you can uh, interview like? Make yeah, definitely. Customer customer definitely. Via these paid channels, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. It was not from the paid channels, like directly, like mm -hmm. we engaged and acquired the newcomers to the app, mm -hmm. and then, like uh, after some period, we read them through the emails and mm -hmm. uh, acquire them, or like uh, invite them on the uh, customer interviews. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah, I was uh, more close to better uh, stuff. So um, I know that um, in Minsk there was another competitor that have a lot of money and they uh, are gonna launch the same product as I do, uh, and I don't have money. So uh, we decided to launch before them. Uh, we bought four scooters. We put them in front of a uh, business center, and um, I was operating them, uh, looking through the uh, window. So I saw people who come and wanted to rent it, and uh, the press, they just uh, wrote about us as the first uh, sharing service open in Minsk, and uh, then uh, the other press, uh, they catch it uh, and spread around. So we get a free publicity uh, to be in first, 
and um, also what was the most important that I was able to go out and ask people what do they like or not like uh, of uh, using the sharing scooter which wasn't the app it was like a telegram bot that we just I, I push the button and uh, open the scooter and uh, and send them the link over uh, pay check to pay is that called the other startup that allow you to generate the link and send it over the messenger and you can pay it directly from the card. So I get uh, the feedback from them, I watch them, I assemble them for my first team and then we understand what kind of product uh, we need to build uh, to like fulfill this uh, requirement. I wonder what was you completed, like 11? Yeah, it was 11. Ah, 11. So you started before so 11. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Okay. Nice growth hack, by the way. Well, I think that uh, founders are usually the best growth hackers uh, rather than marketing specialists, as uh, Peter said. They, yeah, like when you're under pressure or something. I have no choice. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, with Bandadoc, uh, we started to spend on paid uh, marketing only in 2017. I think it was after the first two rounds. So when we had like started some major spends on paid. Before that, we were mostly growing organically through CEO and content. Um, and still, like still up to today, it's the biggest part of traffic that we get. Uh, in addition to that, like our brand uh, grew significantly, so we get like a lot of organic brand direct and viral traffic, and uh, like there is like a big portion of paid channels, but um, it's not 100%. So, like talking about growth hacking, I usually don't call this hacking, but mostly the growth techniques that help you to grow without paid marketing. And yes, we do a lot of these things. Uh, we invest into product-led growth, which is basically uh, about the ways to make your product grow with the help of uh, viral channels, community invitations, and referrals, uh, without big marketing spends. Because uh, when you scale, the marketing, paid marketing becomes less efficient, unfortunately. And the more you spend, then you don't get the um, return that you would want to get. By the way, I checked your blog uh, while I was uh, doing a lecture on content marketing, and I was using it like a success case. So yeah, you had a, you have a lot of <laughs> organic uh, traffic. Yeah, a lot. Of. And I know the guy who worked as a CEO, uh, no, not chief executive officer, but in the uh, search engine search engine yeah. <laughs> optimization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like uh, it's it's still a big part, and I think it's like the cheapest way for startups to to go. Usually, and especially with B two B, there are like some strategies that you can apply, um, and this is well cheaper than paid marketing, but it also takes more time because in order to um, get a lot of traffic through SEO, you have to do a lot of work and wait for the search engines to index it. And, and uh, yeah, once we touched on the on the growth hacks, uh, like. And, and growth channels, is there anything like that you used and can uh, share with, with the others that was like surprisingly very effective that might be applicable to, to other companies? Yeah, I have one. Uh, so um, we, uh, we begin to, I start from the beginning. Like at first we don't know how to open up the sharing business so that it's going to be successful. So we contact uh, our competitors, uh, which was uh, in Canada. Uh, they were far away, and uh, we pretend to be their client. And so we ask them about the information, like uh, what we need to do to be successful. So we do, like, we get all this information, and I begin to create the YouTube um, educational uh, videos, how to open up a sharing business, uh, and. Um, we begin to put it on a YouTube. Uh, we put a little bit of uh, ad uh, budget. Uh, it's like about hundred dollars uh, a month. And um, but also cool that you can give your uh, educational YouTube um, movie to a copywriter, and she can write you an article, and you don't need to spend time to tell her everything. She just uh, look at the movie and understand and write it. 
and so you get um, the cheap way to spread the word and uh, that's how we get uh, like uh, the first uh, clients that were like abroad uh, from different markets. I think uh, just to comment on that, something that's uh, I believe a great practice, do as much mystery shopping as you can. Uh, like I, for example, have an account manager uh, email from one of the companies I Angel invested in, and for majority of due diligence, uh, Boyana on my behalf is, is uh, doing the, the reach out, etc. <laughs> and uh, you can really learn a lot about the companies if you just ask the sales guys uh, good questions. They tell you everything. Uh, and like beat on pricing, etc. And it, it's it's like really uh, it's gold. Yeah. So it's it's probably one of the best time investment to do this like every few quarters to just see what the, the competitors do, how they change the offering, uh, etc. Initially as a founder and then for some reason as as you did with the Canadian competitors. And how do you create your growth hacks? I mean, have you read in any information? But it, it's uh, like a common sense. Like if you want to know information, so go to someone who has this information. And I mean about uh, uh, like I mean scooters that you placed near the business center. Just uh, you didn't uh, you haven't made the preliminary research. You just decided. No, to just uh, just did it because I need to know what the product uh, should look like, and uh, I already knew that uh, the competitor is uh, preparing to launch itself. So. I mean, would you recommend uh, someone uh, in the audience, uh, uh, like, is there is a recipe for, for growth hack marketing thing, or is just uh, the way it works? So, uh, I read somewhere that uh, if you uh, launch your product and you're not ashamed of it, so you launch too late. So, I would advise everyone to launch as uh, soon as possible and get as much as possible information in the early stage. Um, and then you just use a common sense and uh, go from there. Common sense. Talk. Okay, thank you. No, I just like want to continue, but I see people are raising hands. So oh, okay, sure. Yeah. <laughs> there is? Yeah, yeah, I have a question uh, okay. for you, <laughs> actually. I saw that your content team um, were post posting TikTok videos on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you saw a good, um, some good results or unexpected outcomes for B2B from uh, TikTok marketing. Yeah, so this, this one was experimental. Um, I, as, I don't think that we have a lot of people coming from there, but it was something that we try usually. Mm -hmm. So people try different types of new things and channels and not at all channels will succeed. So um, I'm not sure that TikTok will be a successful experiment for B2B, but it was something fun that our marketing team did and they tried. Um, yeah, I'll get, get home and have a look how they're doing. But so far it's like just a small experiment usually, yeah. Um, so they, they didn't share uh, any insights? Um, how, did, how did it perform? Yeah, so it wasn't something huge. Yeah, so likely it's but just like some kind of maybe small success, so I can probably go and have a look home at the analytics, but so far from what I know, it wasn't something big. But like I said, it was fun, and like since people want to try different types of channels, this is a nice thing to do. But uh, you can tell them that uh, you stand out in LinkedIn. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's unexpected to see. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, great to that you saw this, this video. Because, yeah. <laughs> Uh, can I ask a question about the money? Sure. Uh, okay, first of all, this is my first question in my life ever in English about those serious things. <laughs> so, my hair doing tuk tuk tuk. <laughs> uh, the question to Tanya, yeah? Uh, it's about uh, the. You say that you have 32 product managers here. Around that. It's. Uh, hard thing to understand how you communicate with all those guys. <laughs> how yeah. how deeply you know what is going on in your big company? Uh, are you working with the leads or only the product managers? Uh, how deeply you understand what is going on in every team? 
for the two managers? Uh, yeah, so basically they did not appear in one day, so... <laughs> yeah, like, um, I joined Vendedog when we had two product managers, so yeah, it was the second, and then we had, like, third, so we had three for quite a while, three, four, five, and then, like, within these four years, our product management team grew to 33 people, but also our development team also grew from, I don't know, 20, 30 people to... What is the time from 2 to 20? From 2 to 20, it's from 2017, it's four and a half years. So it's, it's quite a long period of time. And so within this period of time, we evolved the team and the processes. And so, yes, uh, we have leads. Yes, so we have product management leads. We have the uh, vice president of product management. So we have like directors of product like me, um, a couple and like a lot of other people who are doing product management. And yeah, this is just like scaling the company in the same way as is it only way? development scales. Is it, I don't know, probably not the only way, but uh, but first, for uh, at some moment of time, the company decided to invest more in development. So basically, creating new things in product, building product, and so we needed more product managers to support that scale. So basically, to define what do we do next and uh, how do we make our product better. So yeah, mm -hmm. as of right now, Pandadoc is quite a big product. I, I think you what are you doing for for especially our company? It's soon enough. <laughs> so thank you, yeah. Okay. Sure. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing for me? Just <laughs> coming A lot back. of documents. Okay. Oh, okay. Maybe coming back to grow for a little mm -hmm. bit, uh, and uh, specifically for the later stage, because, like, first of all, how big is the growth team versus the, the product that would be interesting, but how do you make it repeatable because I understand you have pretty ambitious revenue growth targets, so you need to not only scale the challenges you have, but also come up with the new ones. And uh, I think it's a bit different on the later stage to have a repeatable framework of coming up with uh, like growth hacks or whatever the new initiatives. Well, it, uh, it's easy and complicated at the same time because like the bigger the company is, you have more like people that you can spend and like we invest hard in product that grows like I said so our product uh, team growth team is about 15 percent uh, in comparison to the rest of the product so mm -hmm. it's quite a big piece um, as for some repeatable things like I said so far we still see the potential like to generate a lot of ideas on what to do in growth and it's like I'm even thinking that like okay maybe we will run out of them at some time, but um, maybe not this year. <laughs> I hope. How do you, how do you decide what to implement? Like you have 20 ideas and what you want to launch next door. Like I said, it's like it, it's a complicated process, but usually it's a balance of how long it will take to implement. Uh, what kind of um, kind of return do we expect? Is it usually somehow related to money? This is like the most sweet spot, uh, the things to implement. Or is it something that will help us to um, grow expansion metrics or reduce churn? Something that's impacting the business metrics most is usually that we pick to do. Um, and not that like super hard to do. At the same time, then with this prioritization, you may skip like big strategic things. So, uh, in order to balance that, we have like a balance of small and big things, and so, like like this is usually decided uh, on each quarterly planning. So we have um, the next quarter, and before that, we get together like within these teams of product managers, and then get together with all of the leads of the product management, and we work on the roadmap together each quarter and each year. So. Do you measure, for example, how many experiments are done within a quarter or a month? On no, a no we don't have like in the number of experiments. It's mostly uh, still about the shift that we can make to the metric metrics, either the product usage metrics or the money, the revenue that the product uses. Mm -hmm. And Nikita, for your growth hacks? Yeah, so growth hacks. Uh, okay. Uh, so generally, I would say that uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, growth marketing. 
uh, Heike Teru, because I I'm a like a big fan of I would say in some way evangelist of a uh, growth uh, growth management as a system and a mm -hmm. content marketing scene and a product led growth and we definitely believe in a as well and part uh, itself. So and we are now trying to build a big team around it. And uh, we believe in experiments, but um, I would say like a hex. So at least in my experience, I I haven't done. So. Are you going to try maybe one day? I'm not sure. I understand that uh, like a rational behind the the hacking. So I understand the rational behind the uh, regular experiments like we did. So in uh, my uh, corporate experience, I was a uh, growth lead in one of Minsk publishers, pretty pretty large. It was Apollon, and uh, like we we ran uh, the whole growth thing in Apollon, and uh, yeah, we still. We still like getting back to, to, to this time. We still uh, used to used to do the same process. So just a regular experience around the product. So you try to pick some metric uh, to grow and just uh, iteratively uh, doing the experiments. And so some things are uh, working. Um, some other, so the rest the rest of the things just uh, don't work. So that's it. And, and how do you uh, analyze uh, these experiments? I mean, uh, do you like do you mean analyzing screenshots, analyzing inside the product? What what do you compare like at A/B testing? Mm -hmm. uh, is it more about uh, the way it looks uh, UI? Like I mean, not UI, but marketing stuff, or more about the product? And how do and what how do you compare if it's possible to explain? Uh, I would say so. The general process you just um, like. Depend, depends on uh, the company stage or depends on the product stage. You try to pick some kind of a metric you are trying to go. For example, for early stage company, it might be, I don't know, uh, customer acquisition cost or probably some conversion if you are trying to play around the monetization thing or probably uh, retention rate. And you just, uh, yeah, like making um, a regular A-B test. Uh, and uh, depends on your metric. It might be like a A/B test for uh, ads creatives, like if we talk about the user acquisition, or it might be even the I don't know, like a uh, turning on and turning off uh, different parts of your um, uh, core functionality. If you're talking about the growing the uh, retention, yeah. But uh, like um, uh, David Deep, so it's always about the uh, statistically significant results of your A/B test. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so one probably one of I don't know gross gross hacks from the one side, from the other side it's a cliche. You need to alert your tests or from the significantly uh, statist from the significantly statistical side. Yeah, three tests. I, I tried on the A/B test like on Google Play <laughs> and like since I'm a marketer, but I never tried A/B testing in the product. And, uh, Mm -hmm. Maybe one day we'll try, <laughs> but I don't know what tools you use. Like the amplitude, the same tools. You just uh, to evaluate, it depends. So, like getting back to the uh, your probably question here around the tools. So, uh, like in the end of the day, there is no difference. So, if uh, you I don't know use amplitude or your own uh, BI system or Looker or Tableau, so it doesn't matter because in the end of the day, you just uh, need to be accurate. And uh, to avoid uh, the metrics you picked previously, but uh, yeah, for A/B test, like as a free tool, you can use uh, Firebase to yeah. yeah to use a remote uh, config. Yeah, on the, some kind of a late stage, you can build your own uh, BI system to uh, make it possible to uh, run some remote config tests. I, w I would add that we, uh, for example, do not do a lot of A/B testing in product, like you said. Mostly because we don't have like a lot of traffic. That's one thing, and the second thing is like I usually don't advise people to do a lot of A/B testing if your product is small, or like you're just an early stage. The more important for you to apply some kind of growth methodology is on the question where do you get traffic and how do you achieve like the positive uh, retention among the people who are coming in, so that you can make them stay and scale. And after you figured out these two questions and you've reached product market fit. You can like probably think about A/B testing because like A/B testing just for the sake of it usually this will not give you growth mm -hmm. by itself. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And it's not I, I would say that um, it's not only because we are on the same page of 100%. It's not only about um, some kind of growth 
it's about the product uh, itself because for example if you I don't know like a, a launch your first version and you don't have like a, a retention plateau or at least a more or less significant uh, positive retention like it's just declines on the second day uh, it's not uh, pretty reasonable to make some kind of I don't know small tiny incremental uh, things to try to improve something so there is a like a big problem and you need to rethink or rework your uh, whole version to launch something new. I think that was one of the reasons about the question of the launch time. In one of our portfolio companies, we had a case, we relaunched the product completely, and the monetization went down like three times. It was a disaster, but the engagement went up. Hmm. And we were debating, okay, like, are we actually in trouble or not? And then we decided we just follow the, uh, the, the new product, we fixed a little bit, because we knew that the, the monetization will come after the engagement at some point of time. Like it's, we knew the users will eventually be paying uh, what they're using. Uh, so it was, in the long term, a, a good change. It was just a hit for one month in revenue. Because then you basically mm -hmm. moved everything by, by 30 days. Um, one, one other point, like something very important for the early stage is, is basically finding the product to market fit. Like, when did you know and how did you measure that you actually have the product market fit uh, in place? Uh, <laughs> or when uh, do you know it? <laughs> I'm going to raise uh, the uh, next round uh, of yeah, ne next investment round in a one month. So yes, we, we have a, a product market fit at least for our investors. I would say uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just a joke. No. So um, like it's a, from the one side it's a pretty simple question, but from the other side it's pretty excellent because you can't. So, um, like from my own personal perspective, and uh, from the I don't know, like a bunch of product managers and different kind of you know, product and growth people. So there is no like a uh, right answer how to estimate. Do you have product market fit, or don't you? Like a I don't know, strict uh, like a. One, one number, for example, I don't know, you need to have X retention in a four days, and that's why so you, you have a product market fit. So I define it by a um, uh, bunch of things. The first one is uh, definitely retention. Uh, in uh, some idealistic thing, if you understand the, your user scenarios and your core action, um, retention by um, core actions. And uh, is there some kind of a um, super idealistic walls, a retention by correction should be on a retention plateau. Mm -hmm. So you have at least a small cohort of uh, retained users because um, uh, following the classical uh, TARUS framework, when you have uh, uh, four cohorts of users, targeted audience, um, uh, adopted audience, retained audience, and satisfied audience. So you need to have a retained audience, at least, I don't know, like a 1% or even uh, some dec decimal uh, part of percent. Uh, but you have this uh, cohort who will retain on a long-term perspective. It means that uh, probably your product is not so ideal or you don't solve the problem in a, some ideal way, but you at least trying to solve some problem for a, some uh, let's say a small, t tiny part of the, your potential users. Uh, it's a, like a main attribute, and also you can use uh, Sean Ellis or NPS score, but it uh, depends a lot on your sample size, like uh, of users, and also it depends a lot on uh, the methodology you use. Cause, uh, for example, I just uh, got uh, an email uh, from a type form. I, I think we all more or less uh, all acquired with, uh, with this tool, and uh, they like uh, have tried to reach me to participate in their survey to estimate the type form as a product and to like uh, as a yeah they they uh, proposed me to uh, uh, to take a survey and to win a, a new iPhone for for this. Yeah, and uh, definitely it will bias me as a user, and uh, I will definitely uh, like uh, estimate type form is better as probably I would, would do it in a, just a standard situation, and uh, yeah, so it's some kind of a second order metric as well as a short palace test. Can you please share the email? Mm -hmm. 
So can you take him back in this uh, oh. survey? Ah, no, no, no. Did you yeah, play your product? Yeah, definitely. I'm not so fluent in product. Like, uh, uh, Can you explain a little bit about the Shonelis test? How does it work? Uh, Shonelis test, so uh, like an NPS test is a test when you ask your users, so uh, like from 0 to 10, uh, how you evaluate the product. And uh, Shonelis test, it's almost the same thing, but it's some kind of a how would you disappoint it if product will know of user exist and you have like a different scales usually from a not disappointed at all because I like I get rid of this product from to I would be super disappointed and then like the share of the people who would be super mm -hmm. disappointed should be more than as far mm -hmm. as I remember 40% and so this is kind of like the estimated um, product market fit criteria for like, we did this test at Vendedoc like you know, several years ago. Uh, like we, we got we, we got there like yay. <laughs> like, but uh, yeah, like the retention thing is is better. So mm -hmm. I would recommend that as well. So just to build a retention curve for the action that people do and see if it plateaus. If it doesn't, then people leave the product and. I think like always usage is better because it's actual actions rather than declarations. Yeah. And you the journalist test as a superhuman framework. Superhuman, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, this Rahul uh, popularized, popularized it. Uh, and I, I think they, they presented quite brilliantly how they applied the findings uh, and they were like constantly not hitting the target <laughs> and not launching the product. Uh, so uh, I think that's also you know, how, how was with your product to market fit or, or when you uh, <laughs> Well, uh, we, we already knew that uh, the sharing has a product market fit because uh, it was uh, a big uh, VC round to Lime and Bird. And so that's how I understand that something big is uh, going on and I need to jump on this plane uh, at the beginning. So, um, but. Uh, we first uh, tried to launch our own sharing, which uh, doesn't work, we didn't get enough money. So we pivoted into the platform that uh, helps entrepreneurs uh, like us to launch uh, an e-scooter sharing business. And um, by just uh, seeing the people that they buy our product, they continue to use it and they grow in revenue, that kind of gives us uh, the Inside that uh, we have the product market fit on the uh, B2B SaaS. Uh, so you have the subscription model, like uh, so we, the number um, of scooters. Or? We sell we sell the license for scooter, mm -hmm. but uh, our clients they pay us um, as a business uh, for the months. Mm -hmm. Could I add up one more thing? I just yeah, it's exposed in my mind. Um, if you have also uh, some kind of a significant part of uh, organic traffic, so without uh, paid advertisement, etc., it might be used as a signal uh, that you have uh, some kind of a product market fit, probably pre product market fit. But you need to be super accurate with it because um, it's also strongly depends on the area of your product. For example, in Baltic's portfolio, we also have, for example, a mature company, Flow. And Flow by default has a pretty, I would say, significant part of uh, uh, organic marketing as a periodical tracker. And uh, we don't, because we are like a pioneering this area of uh, weather and health, and uh, it's some kind of a, not, not the metric for us. So probably in the future, but not on the current stage. By organic growth, you mean uh, organic search ASO, yeah? Not like, with the... Yeah, 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 mostly, okay. yes. Yeah, yeah, I know that they can be found because they're working on it, but still it's so I think also referrals can be a, a good policy, yeah. yeah? Like if people are bringing you know, another client <laughs> that seems if this loop is working, that's probably uh, a first Yes, question from the audience. Oh, yes. uh, can I ask a question about uh, Frank and T? You make it because it's very good because I had entrepreneurs at the PC. 
because I remember especially the story of Masayoshi Shan that uh, he invested in Jack Ma, but he knew he was make, faking it, didn't make it. And even, even knowing that the fundamentals were wrong, etc., he just did it. And I thought, how was the return? It was 1,000 times. So that makes me think, what makes a busy investor on, on somebody who actually knows he's faking, did you make it? And just say, no, no, you won't pass this test. So, you know, one thing, if you want to get it to like a very big company, you're going to need to raise a couple of funds. And if we see they don't really have all the stuff they're showing, but we're still excited, it probably means for the next round, even if they don't have anything, they will be equally convincing. And um, I think very often, just to give you an example, one of the companies I was very excited with, the guy didn't have a single line of code written, and he had already sold the product to a couple of clients. So he had like contracted revenue, he just signed the contract that he will deliver the product in six months. So it was like, this is something that's very extraordinary because typically you build the product, you write it, and then you crush it with the market. And he was able to do it without you know, investing a single dollar just with his time. And he was also able to show, I hired an external salesperson to do that for me. So he had like the customer acquisition cost, the, the ARPU, etc. The only leap of faith I had to do is that this guy will eventually be able to deliver the, the product. So this kind of approach, like very good, but it's it's a thin line uh, with the guys that are you know basically bullshitting uh, constantly, and I think you know uh, there are ways to to validate it. Uh, a little bit easier when people have some track record. You basically do referral checks, etc., and that's very often when you figure out when they're gonna be faking it, but making it might, might not be the case. So for a VC, it's not so much a problem, they can say, oh, okay, but uh, there is some promise here. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, so I would like to ask you to recommend, oh, yes, in one question? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, top one or top two uh, projects uh, with machine learning or AI, probably your product is based on AI, yes, mm -hmm. but and how it improved maybe some of the metrics or uh, over user experience. Or it was a waste of money, just saying, it was a waste of money and don't invest into AI or machine learning. Thank you. And then, extra to that, uh, did that come to attract investors? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, am I getting right that you're asking, like, um, um, to improve your product, did you use machine learning or AI? Even yeah, it definitely. And, and like, a concrete example, if you if you have a website, uh, I can't say that it's uh, in a way improved because uh, the whole our product is uh, around the AI, so there is a core functionality. So our product is uh, like a um, prediction analytics of what will happen, and uh, it's uh, doable or it's uh, based on uh, artificial intelligence on uh, machine learning. So that's, that's it. So without, without this part, so there is no problem. In, in our case, definitely. Yeah, in case of Predadoc, I think we had like a couple of approaches, but we haven't been successful. Um, I still think that we might um, add some kind of AI capabilities, but not yet. So, um, not as of right now. Uh, well, <laughs> the same situation, <laughs> but I'm surprised that you don't uh, use an AI. Uh, we <laughs> plan to use AI to predict where to put the scooter, that it's uh, going to be on demand. Uh, but uh, for now, it's too complicated for us, and we don't have uh, so much resource to invest in it now. In the future, possibly. Thank you. And uh, I would like to uh, ask you to uh, share some no advice for startups uh, how to either to raise investments for instance if you have some life hack uh, for instance like create connections at this meetup uh, or for instance like uh, go and pitch everyone in the street as you said like for instance <laughs> i'm joking <laughs> but i mean you should talk a lot about your product or uh, maybe yeah what would you recommend because i think that everyone in the audience is interested in, uh, in uh, so do I, uh, so am I, and uh, maybe some uh, so also recommendations on how to do marketing, uh, and it should be based on probably on your experience, uh, because I think yeah, uh, the real advice that is uh, based on some your previous experience is the best advice, I, I think so. So George, what would you recommend uh, about investments and marketing? Uh, 
One, one, uh, one recommendation and one recommendation for investments. One recommendation for investments and yeah, for uh, the other recommendation yeah. for the marketing. Okay, for the investments, uh, I would recommend um, to bond uh, with uh, someone from NGO Investors uh, Society. Uh, to in, in my case, it was uh, my mentor who gave me tips uh, to, uh, to the insights of uh, what was going on uh, on the backstage. So, for instance, I go and meet uh, NGO investor, and uh, I present my project, uh, and then uh, my mentor he called him and say like, hey, like, did you meet with George? Like, how was his project? He said, oh, well, yeah, it's a nice guy, but uh, I think this and this uh, could be better. So he called me and say, hey, like, like, do this and this and this. And uh, next time I meet with this angel investor, if I uh, if I'm able to deliver that. I show that I can. If not, so I don't. Because uh, the number one rule that uh, my mentor taught me, so never lie to investor. Because if you lie to investor and somebody will catch you, so you will lose the reputation and it will be very hard to uh, raise money. Uh, if we talk about uh, the angel investors, um, probably it's the same in VC. I don't have any experience in VC yet. <laughs> So, yeah, I would advise to find someone inside that uh, has an interest in you. Uh, also, we share the, um, uh, uh, the option to this uh, man. So he's right now uh, a part of our uh, investors. And uh, the advice on the marketing. So educational marketing, I think, is the best marketing when you share the value with uh, your clients, when you educate them and show uh, what what to do with your product and how to extract value from it. Okay, uh, okay so on the fundraising, it's not from Pandavok's experience, but I've seen people doing that. So I think the couple of mistakes that they've made is that um, Sometimes you would look for an investor and you have like a couple of leads who want to talk to you and you stick to this investor or fund and don't look anywhere else and you lose a lot of time as a result. Uh, so one advice would be to do like a very wide reach out to either angel investors or funds and to find these people usually you can do through networking, connections, through people who can introduce you to other people and warm introductions, yes, work much better than just like cold ones because well, with cold ones you can imagine that these people get a lot of um, different suggestions each day and not, of, not all of them are great. There are a lot of people among the Larissian community who are angels, either angels or uh, they have like kind of participated in small funds or they can recommend you to someone. Uh, I can recommend you to someone if you reach out to me. Um, you can reach out to Nikita Mikado, like I said, he's doing angel investment as well. So there are a lot of people, if you know them in the community, they can introduce you. You have to have a good pitch deck. Well, this is like more than one advice that's, that's like basic, but still not that many people doing it well. You have to have like a, a nice set of metrics inside, a lot of numbers, a good team. Yeah, like all of um, the advice that we've seen in the presentation. So. Um, Nothing super special, just just do it. Um, and on the marketing side, on the marketing side, um, so the thing that could work, like uh, George said about it, educational marketing. So I would add that it could be educational, and it could be some kind of content, or um, not specifically educational content, but some kind of templates or some kind of things that you could give uh, away for free for people. Um, build landing pages on top of these things and attract more CEO traffic as a result. Uh, it depends on the product, like whether or not you can do that, but any kind of creative ideas on how can you uh, make search engines work for you will help you to get more organic and more cheaper traffic than you would get with paid marketing. Mm -hmm. um, I have like a two tips uh, from the fundraising side. Uh, the first thing is uh, 
try to find out uh, some kind of a unfair advantage in uh, any area. It might be your, uh, you know, like a pretty narrow expertise or something in your marketing strategy on your product, and etc. Because the whole thing about the fundraising and the fake it until you make it uh, uh, thing is trying to sell the future. Because uh, I, w I would never uh, fundraise anything if I will say, okay, so I'm Nikita and we have like a bunch of guys here and we have nothing, but you try to do something, etc. No, so the whole deck and the whole fundraising is about to show that what you will have, what you would have in our future rather than trying to uh, sell what you have now. And uh, it's a, like a, I would say, a pretty simple thing, but uh, a lot of startups I seen. Um, uh, from from my pers personal perspective, they like a uh, don't have it, so they they trying to build some kind of a one um, one more I don't know fitness app on one yet another something something like a SaaS platform or at least and um, like you with this strategy um, like you have like a much less chances to fundraise and to build something because uh, you will by definition in a red ocean rather than in a blue ocean. Uh, uh, you could uh, go through the good um, uh, the lecture probably or a TED talk, I, I, I don't remember, by Peter Thiel, it's one of the greatest investors of all the times. And uh, he said that uh, like his um, widespread uh, statement was about uh, uh, competition is uh, for losers. So you, you don't need a competition, you don't need to build uh, one, one yet. X, uh, whatever. So you need to find some kind of a um, uh, thing, uh, probably a tiny detail, which will uh, stand out your product and uh, your team. And uh, second thing is uh, probably the simplest one: um, be prepared, because uh, a lot of startups don't have uh, numbers. Uh, like a retention, uh, target addressable market, I don't know, uh, customer acquisition cost estimations, uh, prediction of LTV, and etc. And et so the whole thing about, okay, so it's our first startup and we like uh, three guys and uh, we have a nice idea and etc. and we will have uh, one billion dollars in six months, it, it doesn't work. So you need uh, n numbers even uh, and a business plan, even if uh, this business plan will fail on the first day when you launch your startup. So you will rethink, rework, and etc. But on, um, even uh, before the investments, you need all these numbers and you need a plan. And uh, from the marketing side, uh, design, the, it's, it's not some kind of a um, tip, I would say, or a hack, anyway. Yeah, it's some kind of like a thing uh, from a common sense. Design the whole uh, marketing and acquisition strategy. Uh, try uh, not to consider the paid channels because uh, a lot of startups trying to uh, sell something for the investors um, and they have like a, a slide in their deck with that okay so we will uh, I don't know, acquire one million um, potential customers or even subscribers over the next uh, 12 months just trying to pour a lot of a lot of uh, investments in a marketing budget it doesn't work because uh, you will have a lot of problems you have a competition and uh, you have uh, i don't know some kind of uh, blocks from uh, facebook and instagram uh, things of your credit cards and etc and uh, you will struggle with it so you need to think how you will acquire your potential users and how you will scale without the Facebook or Instagram, etc. Definitely you will use them, but try to understand how to acquire them without them, at least on the initial stage. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe the audience have questions, uh, maximum two. <laughs> 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 yeah, as it's uh, 9 p.m. Uh, yeah, already, if you have, if you want to ask uh, someone uh, in private, you can do it uh, later. Yeah. Okay, one question. Uh, I have a question about uh, priority, prioritization of um, features that or uh, experiments that you are going to launch. And uh, one of the aspects of it are. Uh, how much value will a feature or an experiment bring to your customer, right? And uh, my question is, how do you measure this impact? Like, is it your gut feeling or um, the feedback 
you've, you've heard more requests you've got from your, from your customers or anything else. <laughs> we can okay. stay here so, for a link to more. <laughs> uh, in my case, uh, so we we have the system that uh, each team they have uh, the priorities, which is uh, burning, hot, warm, and cold. So we we give all the, we take all the features, uh, we put them in uh, the priorities, and then we try to understand which features will be. Uh, the fastest and the easiest to uh, to do, and um, usually the big winners is uh, the features that are require a small amount of uh, time uh, and uh, fast to do. Although um, we skip a few corners, and that uh, backfire on us um, because. When we launched our product, so we were going really fast, and uh, at some point we reach uh, the critical amount of uh, writes uh, that uh, our system can digest, I would say, and uh, we begin to get problems with start and stop of uh, scooters, and our uh, customers they were pissed off, and one of the customer uh, he left us because of that. And so uh, we understand that we need to solve this problem uh, quick, and uh, we we do, but it requires more time and effort. Uh, we could have done it before uh, because it was uh, on our list, but we decided to skip this feature. So it's uh, if I would uh, do it another way, I would. Uh, do it earlier, but uh, like somewhere in the middle. I would do it like uh, half a year earlier to to get uh, to understand in front that uh, if we skip corners, where is the line that we need to build it uh, solid? Can I adapt for you? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to answer that usually, like what we do at Panadoc is we have all. Like we have the funnel metrics, right? So we know how many people get in, how many people convert, how many people expand, and so on. And then we know the benchmarks, or we see which kind of metrics are not good enough for some reason. Um, and then we try to attack this specific area. So for example, we have low conversion rates. So we think what we can do in product in order to improve conversion rates. If our conversion rates is fine, the next problem could be acquisition. How many people are getting in? What can we do in order to get more customers to get in? And you're kind of like moving from one bottleneck to another. And in this way, you can like pick um, the things that are like the most painful at the moment. And this probably is applicable to small products as well. Mm -hmm. But so like, you, so, uh, is it correct that you think that uh, the parts of your product or um, Places in your customer journey where conversions are the lowest, yeah, are the most or painful for the customer, and you should go yeah. there. Yeah, and uh, or so like not, not good enough, right? Because like you can benchmark uh, with the help of like benchmarks for other products which are similar to yours, in your category, and see well, like where is your like biggest problem, um, and address that. Um, yeah, if you have addressed all like all of these issues, mostly it's then it's about expansion of your product market fit, and then you think of either how do we add more features for other segments of the customers, or how do we make the same customers buy more and like, you know, like upgrade to the next level of thinking. But you always it's quite selfish, you know, I was asking about, this. <laughs> about the value for the customer, and you're more focused on... Uh, well, the value for, uh, the, value for the, the company. <laughs> for the company, like it's like your first thing that you look at, yeah, and like, through the value of the customer, right? So through usage, through like the more people use, the more they convert, right? So basically, you optimize usage first, and then this should like result in conversion rate optimization and so on. Interesting. Thanks. 
so yeah, so we definitely, as an early stage company, we are working on a, a retention, but on the first stages it might be, I don't know, conversion rates, MRR, etc. So we, are, uh, we as well trying to pick the right stage of the funnel and then about the prioritization. So uh, in general, there are two main frameworks, RICE and VOTE, are uh, widespread across the whole products. So uh, the, for early stage companies, they both don't work because of uh, the design they have. So they have like a, uh, they prioritize incremental changes with a, uh, I would say, high safety, uh, rather than trying to prioritize little moving changes with a pretty risky bets. And uh, that's why so the, there is a third framework. It's called uh, 4D loops. When you try to filter all your changes through the uh, four stages, as I remember, like a, uh, customer value, business value, uh, your vision, and uh, something else. And uh, depends on the uh, product stage, you just uh, try to filter through all of them or just a part of them. Because, for example, an early stage startup, you don't need to filter through the vision because you don't usually have a vision at the I don't know, first, first day of your launch. Thank you. So, I think it's time to finish our wonderful panel discussion. <laughs> I'm sure you agree. I think, like, yeah. uh, thanks for like very uh, making it a broader discussion. I think a couple of super interesting insights. Yeah, and thank you for sharing thanks your for insight. I think I will create us. articles uh, uh, out of your wonderful speeches, if you don't mind, cool. <laughs> and send them yeah. to you. So yeah, thank you very much uh, for participation. Thank you for participating as well. So. Yeah.